Okay, a really interesting topic. Maybe it's the central topic uh, uh, for this course. I mean, really a doubt that anybody in this class would be here if you're not interested in the fate of democracy or the type of democracy that, uh, that your country or other countries can and are likely uh, to, to, to have. So in that sense, uh, uh, democracy and populism uh, is the reason for even studying populism in the first place. And indeed, uh, from a political point of view, uh, what we think about their relationship, uh, democracy, populism, authoritarianism, is indeed, uh, 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 is indeed crucial for us intellectually and politically. All right, so as you know, there's a debate about this topic. A debate which uh, I first carried out in terms of having a polemic, or written, writing a rather polemical piece on, or Ernesto Laclau, even the title, namely political theology would have perhaps angered him, although I don't think so, because he's an extremely cultured person who knew that political theology does not mean that I call him a religious fanatic. Uh, it just means a structure of thought. And that structure of thought, uh, according to someone like Carl Schmitt, is of course present in a lot of secular thinking, whether for the people who think know it uh, or, or not. But that was the first form that I participated in all this. And then, of course, uh, the uh, the choice was democratic or authoritarian. His choice, radical democratic. My choice, authoritarian. But now, if you look at the literature, and I spent, uh, well, I spent my last week reading Trotsky, Russian Revolution, which I urge everybody read. It's a magnificent book, whatever its great problems, and it has its great problems, but still, reading it, that is really fun and uh, uh, and very educational, even for those who study populism, by the way. But in any case, that's what I read most of the week because it's so long. But the last couple of days, I've been reading uh, the essays in the Carlos de la Torre volume, in other words, the literature on populism. And of course, uh, what uh, I immediately realized is that the majority of authors who are more on my side than on Ernesto's side in the debate, say populism is ambivalent from a democratic point of view. Ambivalent. You can see in the very short introduction of, uh, of Mude and Kalkwasser, uh, uh, namely uh, page 83, where they even have a table, democratic possibility consequences, authoritarian consequences. Even someone as close to me, like my former student Carlos, uh, tends to use when he talks about authoritarianism, can or could. And even in one place in the populist seduction that he cites me, cites an earlier piece of mine, not on populism, but on dictatorship, he first cites me and then says that uh, Arado's eschatological or cataclysmic expectations, so he says, uh, are uh, go overboard, even though they must be taken serious. So cataclysmic expectations uh, on the one side, actuality on the other, uh, indicates his ambivalence. And the fact that he uses the word can or could also uh, means uh, that he is ambivalent, though tends to uh, be more on the side uh, of, uh, of interpreting the phenomenon ultimately as an, as an authoritarian one. What I came to realize uh, on rereading uh, the text in this volume uh, is the role of definitions in this matter. I always was concerned about this in the debate with uh, Laflau, uh, but uh, uh, before turning to uh, uh, to uh, my concern, uh, let me just uh, indicate how definitions can play a role in understanding populism as an ambivalent phenomenon. One uh, way of distinguishing between different kinds of definitions, you've seen this in different authors, is to distinguish between populism as a discourse, 
as a strategy, as a style, or as a logic? You've seen that. Uh, did you think that the very idea of treating something as a discourse or a strategy or a style leads to ambivalence? Whereas the idea of a logic leads to clarity and not no ambivalence. Uh, that's more, that's something I thought of this morning. I never really said it in, in any writing, but, but you can see uh, immediately why that should be so, because the discourse may not be really what I'm doing may not indicate what I'm actually about to do or what my friends, like in case of Ernesto, the Kirchner, uh, are doing in Argentina. A discourse is a way of speaking about it, which is not the same as, uh, as, as practice or action or empirical reality. And the discourse itself can have elements of very, very broad democratic commitments, which you certainly see in Ernesto Laplace and some Dalmu's work, and at the same time components which point in another direction. Uh, uh, to the extent that uh, that is honest. You have seen this for Marx in political economy, right? On the one side, uh, a, uh, a, uh, 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 a very uh, 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 positive depiction of the wealth of nations produced by the capitalist system and the capitalist world. On the other side, a crisis theory. Adam Smith and Ricardo do not begin their works with crisis. But it appears through their work at certain juncture. In that sense, the ambivalence about capitalism is in political economy. Okay, uh, I don't want to go too far off field. Uh, so, so discourse ambivalent strategy. Well, that is very ambivalent, right? Because political strategy could work in such a way that we tell our addressees, the people who we are trying to influence or guide or lead, one thing and mean something else. And then style, even more, is only style. It doesn't mean doing, right? I mean, unless you really imagine that social life is nothing but a, but a theater, uh, you have to think that the theatrical part is the show. And behind it and next to it, there's also uh, something else going on. So those ways of defining populism lead to ambivalence on their own. When you speak about a logic, though, and this is very much true in the Marxian tradition, when you speak about a logic, then you really are pointing to, uh, to definite uh, political outcomes implying uh, gainers and losers, and, uh, uh, and, and ultimately the logic of capitalism for Marx, let us say, uh, will lead to a breakdown and, uh, and, uh, and, and socialism. Uh, but this is also because of the injustices which the system entails on all, all levels. So uh, this debate about what kind of definition of populism to give itself is already committing people in some way uh, to what they will say about the relationship with democracy. And this is also true about the famous debate between sin and sick definition. Because if you give a sin definition, and my example here would be uh, immediately a caste, uh, mother, and cultmaster uh, who uh, define populism in terms of uh, 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 a, uh, a thin ideology, uh, which uh, uh, involves, uh, 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 which involves uh, 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 antagonistic relations. If you look at my table to see if I'm getting them right, and then a mannequin relationship between people and an elite, uh, or at least an antagonistic uh, relationship uh, between them, uh, and the general will as the source of political decisions uh, leads necessarily to ambivalence about democracy. And my argument would be that thin definitions uh, by their nature would incorporate so many political possibilities, uh, certainly lots of things that are called populist, but lots of things that have been called merely popular or even democratic, uh, that uh, 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 the outcome is, uh, is inevitably ambivalent, which is what I indicate uh, uh, in my table for those, for those authors. So the thinner you make the definition, uh, the more likely that you will include uh, more, uh, more cases. 
And as far as SIG definitions are concerned, then they really very much will depend on what the SIG, defini what the SIG definition entails with respect to the, uh, the democratic, democratic outcome. So uh, the table uh, on the next uh, page, uh, which of course I will send you separately because I don't know if you can copy them, copy my split screen now, uh, indicates that already definitions matter. But that's a problem uh, for us, uh, uh, right? Because it means that if you are interested in the populism democracy relationship, uh, the kind of definition that we adopt, which uh, uh, Nadia Urbinati calls a thick one, but which I would call an intermediate one between thick and thin, will necessarily indicate a relationship uh, to the democracy problem. And I think uh, it would not be unfair to say that uh, defining populism as a political logic uh, based on a very specific conception of popular sovereignty of the people as one and as homogeneous, uh, uh, focusing on the part whole uh, relationship to the extraction of the authentic people, uh, which populism needs to extract from the uh, population as a whole, the treatment of antagonism in terms of friend-enemy relations, the idea of embodiment in a single leadership and personalism uh, leads one, uh, and the idea of the political as the extraordinary process of, of, of foundations, uh, uh, all this leads to uh, uh, a, a pre-understanding of populism as, uh, uh, as authoritarian in its consequences, though, uh, I think as you will see, even in terms of the idea of popular sovereignty, within the democratic imaginary, as Jean and Nadia uh, both uh, repeatedly say, an authoritarian potential within the democratic imaginary. But this should not be uh, 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 the outcome of mere definition, right? This is the, the problem. That is, if definitionally, I go with mother and godmother, I will come up with pure ambivalence. If I go with I don't know who, because I have not been able to find a left populist definition that leads to democracy and to democracy only, maybe there is one. Uh, I was desperately looking for one this morning and didn't find one, but uh, one morning obviously should not be enough for, uh, for reviewing such large literature. If you choose whatever that X is, then it will turn out to be a democratic phenomenon. The trick, my trick, learned it from the Frankfurt School, who in turn learned it from Marx, is not just construct a definition by induction, and yet looking at all the populisms in the world and taking out from them what is common, or even the construction of ideal types following Weber, which I do use, but I do uh, only at a later stage of the definitional uh, process, but through, and Cesar heard me, say this to a group in Peru uh, just a few days ago, uh, on Monday, uh, I used the Marxian uh, critical theory method of imminent criticism. And, and that saves me from the charge that my definition in advance entails authoritarianism because I take it, here you will know, English speakers will know this expression, I take the definition from the horse's mouth. Well, maybe this doesn't exist in Polish or in uh, various Indian languages, but at least uh, Hungarian, uh, we can say Alosayabo Vesema Definitio. This, I think, would be uh, pretty meaningless to a Hungarian speaker. Uh, in any case, in English, that's a normal expression. I get it from them. I get it from them. I'm not making anything up. I'm not committing to authoritarianism in advance by definition. Indeed, I go with someone who believes that this is the main democratic option today, maybe the only democratic option today, given neoliberalism, given oligarchy and all the rest. And that's like law and uh, to lesser extent uh, with quite a lot of, uh, uh, of ambivalence, Chantal moves. So I go to them and uh, the things I mentioned, and you see it on the board again, are basically taken from, uh, from Laclau uh, with adding the phenomena of elections and uh, sometimes also constitutional politics. That will be our topic uh, next uh, week. Uh, 
uh, but that's already in uh, click and uh, in in Chantal Mook's work, so it's not a uh, an addition to the uh, to the work work of the team. Uh, I think it is pretty easy now, however, to show that once this is this definitional strategy is followed, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Kurt Veilen, for example. Uh, says about his own uh, definition. Again, look at the next page. Uh, I think other people in the volume also say it, that the authoritarian outcome follows from the logic, which itself follows from the definition. And this is true for theirs. Uh, this, I think, is also said by Levitsky in his piece in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the De La Torre volume. Uh, Yes, but they get their definition in a different way, and I am a somewhat protected against the charge uh, to the to the using of imminent criticism. But once it's done, uh, what they say actually uh, applies here as well. So if you think of popular sovereignty, uh, not and there are two options here: not as a plurality, and secondly, not as an incognito, if you want, or a hidden god. Deus absconditus. If you think of popular sovereign not as a hidden god, but as a real presence, a unified real presence capable of action, which at least most of you will recognize as a mythology. Uh, Trotsky, I'm thinking of him because I read so much of him this week. Trotsky says it was a myth, but the Bolsheviks made it into a reality. How did they do it? Well, they did it through a part. The, the Soviets represented 20% of the population. And it's the active part. So focusing on the active part and speaking in their name and leading them, uh, one makes a reality out of the myth. You could already see all possible objections to that particular exercise. And uh, uh, the Bolsheviks carried out uh, the implications of the theory by dissolving the constituent assembly and also the, the city dumas and so on, you can see the point of the exercise uh, uh, though, is that now uh, uh, one can actually speak in the name of the people, but it means that there will be uh, people always, a lot of interpreters as you see, they'll see my, my uh, uh, big diagram stress, uh, the normative claim of inclusion, incorporation, that's one of the key normative claims of populism. But you can see, I, I, you know, maybe I should not marry Trotsky and populism too easily. Uh, of course, he's a greater thinker than any of them, but that's not in itself a justification. Uh, but you can see from the Trotsky analysis here uh, that uh, uh, that a step to authoritarianism has, will inevitably take place because you have to disregard the voice of the 80%. You have to dissolve their organization. You're going to have to uh, uh, carry a political process which does not take them into account unless they become like the rest, which is possible. Every single Russian man and woman could have become organized and active in the Soviet. Uh, but it just so happened at the time of the insurrection in October, only 10% uh, or 20% maximum were so, were so organized. So this, this particular step, which uh, links populism to the revolutionary tradition, to Lenin and Trotsky uh, uh, above all, and not so much to Marx himself, although he occasionally flirts with this figure of thought when he was a very young man, he tended to, the old angles abandoned it altogether. Uh, in any case, uh, this link to the Marxian tradition indicates, uh, at least via Leninism, uh, the possible authoritarian, authoritarian step. And it's similarly part with the part and whole. If you think of the part uh, as the extraction of a of the active part from the rest, uh, then of course it means uh, uh, that you are democratic only in terms of a part, uh, and democracy never uh, formally uh, 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 was defined by anybody, uh, including the social democrats of Marx, as the rule of a part. That's all they got in the Aristotelian theory. At best, aristocracy, not democracy. 
going back to Aristotle, it's the whole, yes, the economy, not women in Athens, not the slaves, not the, not the foreigners. So in fact, what Aristotle is doing is also the part and the whole. Of course, uh, that's what Trotsky would say. He was not a fool. He would have said, are you talking about Athens? Uh, well, they included fewer people than we are including in the active part. But still, uh, uh, because uh, for good or bad reasons, uh, uh, the Greeks thought that there is an ontological difference between woman and man and slave and free, uh, they included all of the free, at least in the concept of democracy. And of course, oligarchy did not include all of them, but only a part of the free. And that's the step which is uh, taken here. The friend enemy concept radicalizes this uh, because whereas in a beautiful Habermas in a real uh, universe, uh, what I said previously would only mean that you are at the moment not yet part of the we, but of course through persuasion and through uh, examples and through learning, you can become part of that. I mean, that's what the most of us originally imagined. Once you have a friend-enemy relationship, things are not like that. Because it then means that you must fight against those who are not part of the we, because they also will fight you. When you suppress the voice of 70% of Russia uh, and uh, allow only the representatives of 20% to speak, the other 50 uh, not necessarily going to just go home and forget about it. That's the secret of the counter revolution. Uh, now, let's let me get my mind away from Russia. Uh, uh, you can see the point uh, pretty well. Uh, and of course, the personalism, uh, which is also part of this definition for not just me, but for so many people, but they call what there are a rare exception. We don't stress one person leadership and personalism. Uh, on also empirical grounds, that personalism, of course, uh, means uh, uh, that uh, when in doubt, unity is that it can be achieved only through a single unit. Because even the already extracted people can disagree. And when decisions have to be made, someone has to make them. Uh, moreover, the project of bringing them together uh, requires unification. Uh, outside of the Habermasian dream world, that's not just persuasion. In the Max Weberian, Max Weberian realistic world, charisma does that too. I mean, how many people uh, uh, did Trotsky, who was very charismatic, literally persuade, or let me get out of Russia and go to India, let's say, I'm looking at Udipta. Uh, how many people did Gandhi persuade? Udipta does say a lot. True, a lot. But a lot is not all. A lot is not all. Uh, for example, the people who assassinate him were not convinced, <laughs> right? And they're not a, and they're not just two or three criminal types, right? So yeah, so persuasion goes a distance. But Gandhi managed to do what he did because beyond that person, that persuasion, he uh, he does not know Max Weber. Max Weber didn't know him because he has so much of that charisma, which Weber has analyzed. Uh, uh, charisma requires very little speech. Uh, you, you just, you, you are there and you say something and people act. And Gandhi could do that, Nehru too. Uh, India was lucky at one time. Well, today it has one too. I'm not so sure they're so lucky with that one. But in any case, traditionally, India had a luck with figures like that, and the Russians too. The Russians too. Trotsky, who debates violently against uh, so many of his uh, uh, opponents, admits that many of them were pretty charismatic, Lenin, of course, himself. Uh, and in this sense, uh, 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 that, type, that charismatic style. But charisma, Weber said, uh, Gandhi would have disagreed, but on what basis, uh, I can't. They really tell that charisma is authoritarian. You accept the authority of that figure and you don't think, you don't reflect, you're not critical with respect to what they say. And that's how it really works on such a gigantic scale 
as the Indian example, as the Indian example shows. Uh, and so uh, that dimension leads to authoritarianism. And then finally, to think of politics can be extraordinary uh, as elections, as permanent elections or plebiscites uh, has an authoritarian dimension too. Uh, and that's harder to show because it has been an old democratic demand is to have frequent elections. And also in the United Kingdom, there was a huge battle the American revolutionaries fought against that of having infrequent elections. You can see this going on in the United States right now, not in terms of frequency, but in terms of participation. Oligarchs want infrequent elections with low level of participation. This was always true when they accepted elections at all. It's always true. Uh, not even when they have support, it's risky. Who knows what the majority of people will actually do in elections? So frequent elections seems to be uh, seems to go against the authoritarian charge, uh, but frequent elections, when they turn into a uh, plebiscite, uh, which are strongly manipulated through media control, uh, uh, through charismatic uh, uh, leadership, uh, through mass uh, uh, demonstrations, and sometimes through the use of even even violence, uh, uh, turns elections. Uh, important democratic device into something other than a democratic format. Similarly, when politics becomes only the extraordinary, when every single moment you are thinking in terms of foundation and refoundation, when the goal, uh, uh, when constitutions never reach the point of the uh, uh, institutionalization of the pouvoir constitué, the constitutive power, the constituent power is always on the scene you know that uh, the democratic impetus of constitutions, namely to restrict the rulers to, to restrain the rulers to, to make them accountable, can no longer work because they will just change the constitution as they go on. Uh, this, I think, Barbara uh, in Hungary will attest to. Uh, and uh, uh, well, I'm looking around the place to see if any Venezuelan uh, here, uh, but in any case, uh, the, con the constant recourse to the constituent power means that constitution as a democratic enabling device, Stephen Holmes' idea of, 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 uh, of constitutionalism as enabling rather than restraining, that enabling function disappears because the constitution guaranteed uh, a lot of other freedoms than just the freedom uh, to elect. It means the freedom to organize, to associate, uh, to club, uh, to speak, uh, to try to persuade. And when you change the constitution, you know, whenever it looks like, and this even means the electoral rule, as it happened in Hungary, uh, changing the electoral rule uh, uh, and the constitution together uh, mean that uh, someone does not want to risk the loss of election, uh, so doesn't want to risk not having election, but does not want to risk of, of losing them. So that's so much uh, on the part one of my presentation. Come, now comes part two, uh, the difficulty. I know I spent uh, looking at the outline uh, uh, much too much time on the first part of the presentation. This happens to me every single time. Uh, it means I speed up uh, uh, a little bit, but you can see from on the outline where you are. Uh, what I described so far was a definition and a logic. And you will know from history that logic and empirical reality are not the same. Let me illustrate it with a weird example, uh, fascism and communism, but communism is the best because it's the uh, one that lived fortunately longer than fascism, fortunately because of the two bad things. Uh, I think fascism is by far the worst. But in any case, uh, the, the history of communism shows how much difference you can the organizational forms and the policies can have over time. I'm going back here to 1917, to war communism, the new economic policy in 1921, Stalin's revolution from above 1928, de-Stalinization after the Second World War, China today, these are all, and even Cuba today, these are all communist systems, uh, or at least each has incorporated in some way or another the logic of, uh, of, of Leninist uh, 
uh, uh, uh, theory and the Leninist uh, 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 politics, uh, but you can see how different they are. The difference is not what is significant for the moment, uh, 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 because there are lots of differences among them, among these forms, but the relation to democracy changes in our each of these settings. Now, you know, uh, uh, everybody knows that you could not have had uh, a Hungarian type of uprising in Bulgaria or Russia, or a Polish type solidarity uh, in lots of other East European countries. You had to have the givens of a particular form of destalinization, uh, which in Poland perhaps went the furthest. Stalin it's, Stalinism itself has not done, has gone uh, the least far in the Polish case. For example, agriculture was not ever formally collected. Uh, so in this sense, uh, the different context gave options for democratic politics that were always different. Kadarism in Hungary certainly involved the possibility of forming what was called the second public sphere of the opposition in the, uh, in the 1980s. It also allowed detotalization in the economic sphere uh, through the new economic mechanism that it was called. So different periods of communism have different relations to democracy. I know this goes against the grain of totalitarianism thesis, which always seem to argue that the thing is always identical. Uh, you know, my friend called the four road of peace, uh, former friend, that's the way. Uh, Stalinism without Stalin, and he was describing Khrushchev's reforms. Well, he was a neo Trotskyist at the time, and I can understand why he was so radically opposed even to Khrushchevism. But in Russia and in East European countries too, uh, uh, that period of reform brought big changes. So, in this sense, uh, the relation to democracy uh, is already with respect to a much more closed system, namely communist or Marxian Leninism, uh, is already. Uh, uh, demonstrable. And I would say that even for fascism, that's a little weird to do it for fascism, but I think uh, Mussolini in Italy in the early 1920s still put out the parliamentary structures. How is Gramsci a deputy and Mussolini is in power? Do you ever ask yourself that? Well, of course, in the end, he winds up on a prison island, and that represents two different stages of even Mussolini's fascism. And I think you will see in the case of Franco too, uh, significant changes uh, as the system develops. It doesn't lose its fascist authoritarian character altogether. Uh, uh, in Mussolini's case, it only increased uh, that character. But had it survived the war, there would have been perhaps changes too. So this, I think, is always relevant to populism, uh, namely uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the ambivalence, which is which is due to historical context. Now, in a populist case, the significant difference in context is whether populism emerges in an undemocratic setting, an oligarchic setting, or an already uh, formally democratic setting. This is more what is significant than the actual issue of time. And obviously, we're speaking of a lot of countries which have all different histories and therefore different uh, different temporality. But uh, uh, classical uh, uh, populism, about the very first version of populism uh, in Russia, uh, emerges under an autocracy. So it could be ultra democratic in terms of its goals, but could not be democratic in terms of its practice. I guess none of us would consider assassinations to be a particularly democratic. Uh, form of politics, and this is what the Russian populism was engaged in. Uh, at the same time, under a liberal democracy, the American populist uh, never broke with democratic, democratic method. But the goal, in a certain sense, was for both of these cases, including the excluded, giving the excluded a voice, which they did not have, which they did not have previously. And that could be done under a better democracy, said the American populist, or a democracy, a liberal democracy, because most Russian populists were either liberal Democrats or liberal Democrats tinged with a kind of socialism. Uh, and in this sense, the goal could be democratic. Uh, in the one case, the pragmatic was one way, the other, uh, 
case, it was the other way. In the case of Latin America, the issue was already more complex because you had, in all the settings, the early ones are, are uh, uh, Peru uh, for opera. Uh, no, uh, yes, uh, Argentina for, uh, with Peronism. Uh, some people put Irigoyen's liberal regime under the heading of populism too for the 1910s for Argentina. Uh, for Brazil, Vargas uh, regime for Mexico, the pre, uh, starting with with Lazaro Cardenas. In all these cases, uh, previously, uh, Mexico perhaps uh, represents a somewhat uh, different uh, case. There is already some kind of uh, electoral democracy. But these electoral democracies are understood in each of these cases uh, uh, as highly exclusionary oligarchies. So populism could uh, dedicate itself to uh, uh, removing the oligarchic character, which would have to be done through inclusion. This is Carlos de la Torre's stress. Uh, traditional populism is a populism of incorporation. We should be careful because in some countries, the issue does not disappear with universal suffrage, universal women's suffrage, and all the uh, rest of the devices for election. Uh, and this is because of either uh, forms of heterogeneity that uh, that continue to exist, and this means above all the indigenous in the Indian republics who never become formally part of the political system, uh, or they who do not become materially part of the political system in spite of their abstract rights uh, to participate because of literacy, uh, because of repression, in the countryside and in, in tribal areas. And it goes also for what has been called now the precarious. In other words, new forms of, uh, of being excluded from the political system. Uh, uh, the precarious is in a way a reflex of the cartel party phenomenon. Cartel parties emerge uh, almost everywhere as a function of some kind of historical compromise between liberalism and social democracy. The social democrats become more uh, uh, neoliberal. Uh, the, uh, the neoliberals and the liberals uh, adopt some uh, 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 dimensions of the welfare state that they defend. This leaves out the precarious. It leaves out people who, in some countries like Peru, represent half the labor market. Uh, so, an enormous part uh, in the period of Fujimori already, uh, they represented a very significant part. Uh, already, and, and they are not uh, uh, represented by the existing parties. The old fashioned populists who tend to the left, uh, uh, the neoliberals uh, uh, like Margaret Yosa, uh, who uh, uh, proposed radical marketization as the answer to everything the market these people already had, and it still allowed them to live in complete poverty. So, some new form of representation. It's not just exclusion, is not even the right concept year or not necessarily is that a lack of representation. The representative systems do not represent them. And so in this sense, uh, some aspect of the new Latin American populism can recover uh, the features of the of the classical one. But what about countries? What about countries uh, where uh, 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 there is no precariat of this type? Where there's no huge indigenous population which is excluded, you know, Australia would still have a small indigenous population among the developed Western countries, which is rare. Maybe the Roma in some countries like Hungary represent uh, a particular target of exclusion. Uh, uh, so there could be in could be pockets of exclusion, but still uh, under uh, liberal democracies, uh, exclusion of the immense majority or a very large number, it's just at 70 percent, uh, cannot be the issue. Uh, but uh, representation itself, uh, from the very beginning, involves uh, uh, a democratic deficit. Uh, so for those who feel that parties uh, represent them only once a year when they ask for their vote and never the rest of the time, political party systems always represent a problem. And the question of bridges between them uh, it becomes uh, an issue that can be thematized by critics of uh, representative democracy. 
Uh, this is a reason for my thesis, which I introduced, I think, earlier on in the course, that uh, the democratic deficit of existing representative democracy can be addressed only through the expansion of democracy, through processes of democratization, for which there's always room. There's always room, uh, because uh, uh, which country has really industrial democracy today? Uh, which country has local democracy that truly decides uh, all the local issues through the principle of subsidiarity? Uh, these ele elements of these exist in different countries, but they can be further developed. Uh, and so in this sense, uh, even for countries which are formally uh, representative democracies, there is an issue. And this is what the contemporary populations in Europe uh, very often, uh, uh, very often, uh, uh, very often focus on. Uh, so I would say uh, that uh, 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 that uh, 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 at different historical moments, uh, uh, the democracy problem is different. Populism focuses on the democracy problem, but it focuses on different democracy problems. It can advocate liberal democracy. Uh, or liberal social democracy as the Russian populist uh, tended to. It can advocate uh, inclusion of the excluded uh, as early Latin American populists uh, very often uh, advocated, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it can also advocate the, uh, uh, the continuation of the democratization process which has been halted. And in our setting, it's very much interfered with a topic I dealt with already in this class with globalization. Because the process of democratization uh, uh, cannot proceed if the powers of the national state, which is being democratized, are dramatically reduced to various races to the bottom. And so this too becomes a possible target of a populism. All right, well, that kind of brings me uh, to, uh, uh, to two other sources of ambivalence, aside from the historical context. One I want to deal with extremely briefly, and the other one a little more detail. Uh, and this is just an obvious point, which will be of most relevance to Europeans, uh, because in Latin America, presidentialism exists in almost every country, and the electoral rules tend to be majoritarian in most countries, though not in Brazil, for example. Uh, those choices, of course, affect the possibility of populism, because you can gain a lot of support, but under conditions of separation of powers, federalism, I should have had it on the board also, uh, electoral rules that fragment the population, uh, it is very difficult to go to get into power alone. As even Trump found out, right? Uh, uh, he did not initially control the courts. Okay, you can change them, but then came an election and he no longer controlled the House of Representatives. And of course, uh, I always uh, think of this, although it never really came to a head, California and New York are like states. Federalism would give these states a lot of ability to go their own way and to even break, uh, uh, limit the power of the central of the central world. Depending on these kinds of arrangements, I should have federalism on the board, easy enough to put it in because uh, because uh, this is my program. So federalism versus centralism. These all can make a difference for what kind of populism you're going to have and how populism is going to work and how its relation to democracy is going to be handled. Because if you are just one branch that you can't uh, immediately deal with uh, with the democratic uh, role of the other branches. If you're in the federal system, uh, you may control the central government or you may control a state as you long once did in the United States, George Wallace too at one point, but it doesn't mean you control the rest. So, so your chances of converting everything in an undemocratic way are affected by the existing political, political structure. The most important source of ambivalence though is organizational form. I was very happy to hear a young woman in the Peruvian group come to this on her own 
and raising the ticket question. Now, this was our topic last week, so I don't have to spend too much time on it. Uh, you know, a movement in civil society, a party uh, in government, the government, a regime, which kind, hybrid or authoritarian. This is what I talked about last week. So I'm not going to have to sum it up, thank God, because I'm, I want to stop in six minutes. But what you can already see, and this is the point she made in that Peruvian group, is that the different levels you have a different relation to democracy. A movement in civil society, Carlos Delatorre actually, I just noticed today, doesn't even consider them populist, even when they have a populist rhetoric. And that's making really the same point on a terminological level that I'm making now. Uh, those movements uh, can play the role that other movements play, criticize, point to the very existing and serious democracy deficit in existing systems, which is universal. And they can even, uh, can, ally themselves with other movements in order to address those deficits. Uh, one of the crucial thing that you see in Bolivia, where the Maas uh, party uh, formed by coca growers or a kind of uh, rural union uh, 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 had indigenous leadership to begin with, but established important links to indigenous movements that are totally independent of it. And it could achieve its goals only through that kind of alliance. Uh, this is especially typical on the movement level. But it can still exist on the next level, on a party level, because to get a win in an election, you need votes. And not every vote necessarily agrees with everything you say. Uh, this is the point that Lenin and Trotsky tried to, this is the problem Lenin and Trotsky tried to avoid uh, by not having elections at that time. But the populists are wedded to, uh, to uh, universal suffrage and to uh, elections. And so they will need uh, either alliances or at least the, the tolerance the friendly attitude of others who are not themselves part of the movement, but who have to vote for somebody, and they may not want to vote for some group very, very small, and so they will choose the populist as the next best option. You've got to be appealing to that as a party. But as a party also, of course, uh, you produce a form of organization that cannot be too universalist. A movement can allow antinomies within it, divisions within it, but once you are trying to get the vote, you got to watch it. And this is especially true for left-wing parties who always have to watch their own radicals. Well, probably right-wing parties too. You know, Le Pen's party still has fascists, right? I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but we can assume it. Uh, but nevertheless, those fascists cannot be too loud if Marine Le Pen is ever to win a presidential election. Now, she herself is probably no longer fascist in the, in the form of her father. But in any case, there are people like that in, in her movement. The father had to be expelled uh, because he was too powerful. But in any case, others are still there. They cannot be too loud. So you have to control within your movement the number of voices. And this, of course, means that authoritarian steps are taken. I don't want to say necessarily of a Bolshevik type, uh, but still, uh, you know, you have purges in the fascist movements too, both in a, out of power and in power, even more important in power, because once you get to the next stage, then your previous allies and movements can threaten you. You're not carrying out your promise. Or some other leader says, you know, you said you're the people, but I am really the people. I speak in a more authentic voice. I'm more like the people anyway than you are. But that could not be really said to Chavez. But to Fujimori, I don't understand why he was not uh, vulnerable to that particular charge. You know, you want the incorporation of the precariat, but you're really a university rector by, uh, by profession, right? And you're a Japanese person on top of it. I don't want to make too much of it. Uh, uh, the Jap I, I, I love the fact that you people in, uh, in Peru say Zar, sometimes call them the Chino. <laughs> that kind of indicates how authentic representative he is of the, of the Peruvian people because they could not even fathom many of his voters uh, what a Japanese person is. 
So he was a Chinese. Uh, well, you can imagine some racist reasons why uh, one would make that particular step. Uh, but still, they are good natured steps because, you know, other people called the Chino voted for the Chino. <laughs> and so that was really uh, something that, uh, uh, that was a vulnerable point. And of course, the fact that this is the most violent populism in power who carries out a self coup is not, as we used to say when we were Marxists, not accidental. Because his ability to embody the Peruvian people suffers from, uh, as the Germans would say, Einige uh, Schönheitsfehler, a few uh, 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 beauty uh, deficiencies, a few, <laughs> no, it's not a very good English term for this, a, a, a few uh, uh, lags uh, uh, in, uh, which, uh, uh, which he probably had to address through demagogy whenever he could, but he also addressed the repression. Uh, Cesar corrected me in the group, telling me, well, the guy tended to prefer bribery to repression. Bribery is another method, is another method. And so, uh, uh, so of course, uh, you have to adopt uh, an equally un undemocratic tool, right? Because repression is undemocratic, bribery is undemocratic. You use both. And indeed, populisms do turn clientelistic. So it's not only Fujimori who really is a corrupt guy, as everybody now knows, but it is also the other populists who may not be personally corrupt. I don't know if Perón ever enriched himself uh, 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 to his uh, political dominance. Uh, but in any case, uh, clientelism is used. And so those who are working with us are the ones who are going to get the goodies. That's, uh, that becomes uh, necessary once you have a, a populist government. And then, of course, uh, the problems uh, 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 that the separation of powers and indeed the existence of independent media present. And so at that stage, uh, 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 a move from being in government do government, which implies uh, a, a authoritarian turn, and then even form a regime which no longer has real elections, uh, where you cannot lose an election anymore, uh, even if there are elections, uh, follows from, uh, from that particular state. But as you can see, uh, something that can begin as, as a democratic critique, and even a form of democratic collaboration with other movements, uh, can uh, go through stages, historically these are not stages always, as I try to warn you, can go through uh, mutations, transformations, which cut into that initial uh, uh, democratic claim and democratic uh, promise. So deciding how ambivalent we want to be about populism, we have to look at the particular organizational form. Does it mean that we take the most authoritarian form and make it the secret of all populists. A lot of people really attempted to do this, and I personally have to admit that sometimes I am too. But there are other possible options because you can use uh, uh, populist mobilization, even the electoral victory of a populist party, uh, to force the Democrats to democratize. And once they have done so, you can say, the Moor has done his work, the Moor's job is finished. Remember Shakespeare. And in that sense, uh, you do have the option of turning liberal democratic. That's what Chantal Mouffe, in my mind, is ultimately doing with respect to the Lachloian conception. And it is not just Chantal Mouffe, but it's Podemos that not only participates in a coalition, but is transforming its, uh, uh, its persona. Uh, someone told me, I have to look this up, maybe you can find this on Google very easily, that Erhard John, I'm not even sure how to pronounce his name, uh, Ignacio Erheron, uh, uh, I'm not even sure that's a, uh, uh, a, a Spanish. Erheron. Er, Say it. Errejón. Errejón. Yes, yes. Errejón, yeah. It's simpler. So mm -hmm. Ignacio Errejón apparently said to Santa Move, don't call me a populist. Don't call us populist. Uh, 
uh, let's find it at some point on Google if that's really the case. But it would indicate uh, that there is no teleology which is actually determining here. You can use popular slogans and methods to come to power, but you may not convert the power in a populist way, but will you still be a populist if you do that? And the same question comes out for the full authoritarian term. As I already told you once, uh, one of my Russian students who is now back in, in Petersburg, uh, uh, Greg Yudin, uh, told me that, no, Putin is just an authoritarian, he's not a populist. And there are friends like uh, Gabo Halma who think that Fidesz is not populist, but just authoritarian uh, from the outset. Uh, I tend to disagree with that because the discourse remains important. The idea of fighting permanent electoral campaigns when in power indicates a link to the populist path. So for me, in my conception, populism as the government still incorporates the party and the movement. But it is possible, certainly, for a populist uh, uh, force sufficiently threatened by elections to accomplish a full conversion to authoritarianism. And in that case, of course, the relation to the democracy will be zero. Okay, I stopped. I went a little overboard, but maybe not too horrible. Yeah. Uh, so you said that, uh, I thought it was really interesting what you said about charismatic leadership and populism, because that sort of fits into this understanding of populism as an affective and discur discursive construction. Uh, but I was wondering, like, does it always have to be authoritarian? Well, authoritarian and authoritarian are two different terms in English. Now, you know, if you're a leader, you're by definition authoritative, right? That's not what you mean. I mean, you know, you have to have some kind of, uh, uh, of confidence that what you say will be accepted, even though not necessarily uncritical. All leaders have that, and it's a very important part. Even Habermas must speak about this, because the idea of, of everything being deliberated and discussed is impossible in a political world. So, so you have to accept, you know, if there's a, Right now, my leader is Joe Biden. And if Joe Biden says something, unless I really know right away that he's wrong, which can happen very soon, uh, I will, of course, uh, say yes, to the extent that I can do something or others can do something, they'll do it. So even in this kind of very benign setting, and he's as benign as we can think of in the domain of leadership, uh, we, you know, uh, uh, I don't say ever. I don't say Nehru was authoritarian to turn to India, and I don't say Gandhi was authoritarian. Interestingly enough, either, uh, but in his case, his authority, defined properly, is so huge that the guy doesn't have to be. You know, if you want to turn out, uh, you know, a hundred thousand hunger strikers in a big Indian city, he could ask for it and they would do it. There's no sanction. There's no punishment. Uh, there is no uh, exclusion. Uh, in the next demonstration, you could participate even if you didn't participate in the previous one, right? So you can be very authoritative without being authoritarian. Now, I don't say that Gandhi was not occasionally authoritarian, uh, though he's, he's very, very interesting from this point of view because of his leadership in formal organizations, which he was easy which easily enough gave up. So he's a really interesting case. I mean, uh, you know, looking at you and Udipta Saad speaking of India, but it is actually a great example uh, because, because the two categories should be separated. Now, authoritarian is someone uh, who uses sanction in some way. Uh, they need not be negative sanction. For example, uh, uh, did Gandhi ever do this, right? Uh, 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 I will give you a reward if you come, and you won't get the reward if you don't. I doubt that he did that. It's actually called a bribe, uh, right? And uh, and that is authoritarian already, as we said, as we would say it are with respect to Fujimori, because the uh, the positive sanction, as it is called in sociology, easily turns into a negative one by by depriving a person of it. So you're part of a feminist group, some uh, part of our 
of Buenos Aires, you say Recoleta, I mentioned one where I've been, uh, you're part of the Fernandes group and you get some kind of uh, subsidy, in other words, some governmental jobs. And then you demonstrate against one uh, in, in some setting when demonstrations are being organized. And you are told pretty quickly that that particular source of jobs and subsidies is not forever. That's authoritarian, right? Uh, now, of course, if you're actually punished by exclusion, kicking people out of the party, uh, this is very common, of course, in Leninist party. Uh, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, the fascist leader too, uh, that's already much more serious because what will happen to you after you get kicked out? And then, of course, further possible sanctions. So I would say authoritarian leaders are charismatic uh, they could never, even logical grounds, could never uh, uh, hold together uh, everybody to purely authoritarian needs. Max Weber has it this way. The administrative staff must be moved to legitimacy, says Mao. Okay, but still you get the idea that, that Max Weber explains uh, very well that uh, uh, someone like, let's, let's say Gandhi, uh, say Modi, cannot just operate through uh, uh, repression and, and, and bribery. He must hold together some kind of political group that acts on his behalf. And so that's like legitimacy is a component of even authoritarianism. I know, Akansha, this is like, you're, le you, 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 you're letting me do a kind of introduction to sociology here, uh, but it is so fundamental that I don't think it's, it's, it's a waste of time. Authority, Hannah Arendt has written on it extensively. Authority is a very important component of our life together. Can't do without it. You know, if you're a four-year-old like my grandson and, and, and you don't accept the authority of my son, things are gonna go very badly in that family. He does, he's great. And the father is so, uh, so non-authoritarian that it works great, but it is an authority. It is an authority. So it is part of our life together. We have to have that. And we have it. And we have to have it in politics. Authoritarian means something more than that. And I think I defined it as using positive and negative sanction to cement uh, uh, your persuasive powers and your ability to persuade people. Those who you cannot persuade, uh, you're going to uh, force in some way to adhere either by not being there, exclusion, or inclusion, but then you have to accept some sanction. The emotions in an organization, not getting uh, uh, the promotion you accept is another version of that. Uh, and now for populism, would pure authority do, that's gonna be your, your question, the Gandhian question, is Gandhi then a populist? But there will be similarity. Did he, however, ever demonize his enemies? You see, you already say no, right? In some moments, he might have said some bad things about some people. You know, he was not, a, not as much of a saint as, as the image. But on the whole, that's not the strategy to demonize your enemies. No, no, no. He was really the last Habermasian in actual politics. He went out either try to persuade them or to demonstrative action. Well, Martin Luther King, so it's not, Gandhi is not the last, right? It happens elsewhere too. And of course, uh, uh, King was a very careful reader uh, of, uh, of some Gandhi texts and follower of Gandhi's life. Uh, so uh, are they populists too? Now, by my definition, no, because, uh, and along with most of the definitions that on that page, the uh, the friend-enemy relationship belongs to it. Now, what would it be without the friend-enemy relation? Well, it could be a very powerful popular movement. I mean, we're playing with words a little bit now, but uh, I prefer defining it in this, in this way because we have enough examples of it, and they're the ones that represent a significant uh, 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 problem from point of view of of democracy. Gandhi only helped to democratize India. 
didn't get democratized his way because he was, as I would uh, also teach in my undergraduate class, he was trying to combine direct and representative democracy in some creative way for which he never produced a text that explained how that is to be done. But surely his method indicated that. But still, he wanted his friends in Congress uh, to uh, get rid of the colonists and to put a representative democracy in its place. Now, OK, you could say that's an early stage of populism. Because in some early stages, uh, you know, India is a country suffering exclusion. Colonialism, but it's instant which did not give the majority of people under the system of British rule the vote. Well, it gave them some votes in the provinces, but never a vote for parliament. The thing uh, that the American revolutionaries fought for, Indians in 1940 still did not have. People made decisions for them at Westminster, and they didn't get to vote for those people. So in that sense, uh, uh, Exclusion is a problem still, although now it becomes complex because of the provincial organizations and all the rest, but still it is a problem. So you could say uh, Gandhiism is part of this very early populist world. But if you want to do that, you can do that. Definitionally, you have to leave out the friend and enemy concept. But certainly the idea of the constituent power is part of it. I mean, they were going to create a new constitution. That's part of the deal from from 1918 on, right? Constituent power was going to be used. Was a part of the population going to be understood as the whole? No, you see, Ludwig says no. And that's my inclination is still to say no. And Gandhi really was, was very good on the Muslim question. Very, very upset about the Muslim Hindu division that was already being used by lots of people on both sides. So, so yes, and, and the untouchables, the Dalits, that's a very big inclusion problem, right, within India itself. Well, uh, I don't think uh, that uh, Ambedkar would have joined these guys if Dalit exclusion would have been uh, implicit in the, uh, in the, in the, in the project. Uh, so yes, it is inclusionary, but it is not defining the people. And I go to the Vipra here, who head shaking are as following. A part is not interpreted as a whole. So thank God we can leave Gandhi out. There is leadership. Mandela was a leader. Gandhi is a leader. They're leaders. Even Valencia in the good days was a leader. And in the bad days, he decided to fight against the democracy himself and uh, turn populist thereby helping the development that in the end has excluded him in a very radical way too. That often happens. But in any case, yes, leaders, no, I'm not, this is not a polemic against leaders. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible really to organize people on a large scale uh, without substituting for communication through authority. To go back to your, to your question. But that of course, mean authoritarian temptation, the step between Mandela and Jakob Zuma is a serious one. Or the step between Viktor Orban in one persona and Viktor Orban in the second persona, <laughs> he didn't even have to ship another person, but still the same person, just with a completely different relation to democracy. So that can happen. Authority can be abused and become authoritarian. And we see this in the United States. And it is not just that bastard. It is even uh, Andrew Cuomo, whose name I can mention, because I feel very ambivalent about, about what he's going through. But in the case of the other person, I shouldn't mention his name. But it is not just him. Authority is something that can be abused. And that's true for the family too, right? I said the authority of my son is good in his little family, but in mine with respect to him when he was young, but it could have been abused. I don't think I did, but I, you know, 
for him to say. I don't think he is abused with it. But you can see the point, right? That it is, it's, 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 it's a dangerous thing. And charisma even more, because it kind of means automatic obedience. You know, that's not true for my son and his, and his, uh, his own son. You know, he tells something, and of course, uh, the little kid, Raphael, says, why? Immediately says, why? And it takes a Havamassian interaction to convince him to come out of the playhouse in the playground because eventually the family has their dinner. You now you see the point, right? Is that he says, why? Give me a reason, give me a justification. And on this level, Havamass works. But what if everybody who was supposed to join Gandhi's demonstration asked him to prove it to each one of them on their, in their own way? It's not possible, right? So charisma makes them do it. Or his previous success in organizing things because his charisma wasn't just, I don't think he had much of it when he was in South Africa still. No one ever said. It was sort of developed in the Indian context through uh, uh, a lot of discipline even and self-abnegation that in India work. It wouldn't necessarily work for Martin Luther King, you know. If, if he doesn't eat, it doesn't mean that uh, anybody else will follow him. But in you know, every culture, you have to do it differently. But he had to do things. But at a certain point, he had it, and then there's a track record. And that track record means that, yes, we can follow this person. Okay, that's an incredibly long answer to my 17 minutes I took on your question. But I think that question is, is so fundamental that I, I, I'm not sorry. It's just that, you know, if you study Marx and Weber and these folks uh, and the career and the writings of, of Gandhi and Nehru, uh, you will find, uh, you know, you can, you, you can learn all this, but it, it is something that, that we don't know automatically because, you know, we can be two. We can be pre authoritarian and listen to people too easily. Or we can be so anti authoritarian that we listen to nobody. And both are problems in politics. Okay, who else? Yeah, Andrew, on, on this issue of uh, charisma, the other side of, of course, is the issue of succession. And that too oh, well. leads to uh, authoritarian uh, regime. That's a regime question, in a sense. And it's, it's really a fundamental question, which. Uh, uh, Weber did deal with. Uh, it can be institutionalized in Weber's sense, but of course it doesn't work the same way anymore. You know, you can always say that, uh, well, after all, it is George Washington's constitution or Lincoln's constitution or FDR's constitution, so we should follow it, uh, but they're no longer here. And somebody else might challenge it, and it can happen even in the same family. Uh, you know, you could say, Mrs. Gandhi could say, I'm Nehru's daughter. But that's not the same anymore. Uh, because in some ways, Nehru's principles and constitution, which established a powerful court, for example, it was Ambedkar who did so, actually, not so much Nehru, who was much more a British type of uh, parliamentary sovereignty. But still, Ambedkar, the other founding framers, had he created this constitution, and Mrs. Gandhi is uh, is Nehru's daughter. So, what do you do? Can charisma be inherited? She was actually pretty charismatic on her own, but it was borrowed from from the father. And 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 there is the constitution, which is Nehru's constitution, much more than than Gandhi. And so the two become. Then there is a tension. So institutionalization. Uh, can be a, can be challenged by new forms of charisma and different interpretations of the very same institution too. Uh, charisma can't be just interpreted so easily. Uh, you know, if, uh, I'm sorry, but I stated Gandhi because it's such an easy example. Uh, you know, you could say several people might have said to Nehru, "You're not really the legitimate follower of Nehru, of Gandhi," and somebody else could have said, "I am," and you could debate and. You know, it could be something that could already be open to, to, to challenge. Uh, but Gandhi himself could resolve that question as long as he's alive. 
right? But who else is to resolve it after if it is being contested? Ambedkar and Nehru could argue about uh, uh, how soon we're going to have a reform of the uh, of the the system of caste. And Ambedkar would have wanted them right away on day one, and Nehru didn't want to uh, to infuriate lots of people uh, who were wedded to that. And he's the prime minister. Gandhi is a quasi-religious leader of the people. But Nehru is the prime minister. He can't have any more civil wars. They only had a few. So you can see how in, uh, in terms of the succession of charisma, there's a problem. There's a problem. Uh, now, populism will face this problem uh, in lots of settings. Um, and, you know, you can have a disaster at its outcome. Uh, you know, Maduro following Chavez is a disaster. I mean, how many people outside of maybe uh, the political bureau in Havana and his own narrow circle in Caracas uh, will not concede that this is a disaster? And yet it continues because precisely of those two forces which are keeping it going. So it's been totally replaced by a repression. That's, that's the only way to explain it. You can't have a vote now, a free and open vote supervised by the OAS in Venezuela. You could still have it in Bolivia, interestingly enough. And it's even contested how it came out. That's Morales. So, you know, uh, you, you can see the distinction. Morales is a charismatic leader himself. Maduro has zero charisma. I mean, listen to him. Uh, you know, Chavez was kind of brilliant. He was not educated, but he was, in terms of his, the, the phrases he would invent and the, uh, the, the, the ideas that he would come up with, he, he was creative. Uh, Maduro has none of that. Uh, so in that sense, the succession did not work. Interestingly enough, it works for Peronism in a certain way. One of the ways is through marital relation. Already, uh, Evita uh, was the more charismatic of the two, of the two people, right? I mean, you don't get Broadway shows uh, uh, written about you unless you really have something. And so uh, Evita was already there refurbishing the charisma of one. But then subsequently, uh, it could be continued after his death by another spouse. So there is that possibility. Indira Gandhi represents a certain version of that too, uh, because she did not immediately win the succession battles in Congress. But in the end, the fact that she's Nehru's daughter uh, uh, helps a lot. And then, of course, she tried to groom her own sons. So she came to believe that this was the best way of, of running uh, Congress. And even down to this day, uh, there are junior Gandhis, uh, uh, right? They called Gandhi that particular family, interestingly, because I don't think they're even a relation to Mahatma Gandhi in that sense. But they, uh, it's the Gandhi family. They still uh, produce heirs, sometimes Italian women through marriage. Uh, get to play a charismatic role. Uh, listening uh, leadership is, is a pretty flexible instrument that can be used in, in different ways. But still, there is a problem. There is definitely a problem. And Viktor Orban will face that problem. This, I think, is what Akos Koparini said in a discussion uh, last week, that one of the things that's likely to happen is for that self will split then unfortunately, he said the guy is 56 years old. Is that correct, Barbara? Or about it's 56 or 57, right? Uh, you know, I always used to think of him as a really young man. But, you know, uh, eventually young men get older. And the 56, uh, and at the start of life he lives, which must be fairly intense, uh, you don't quite know how long he's going to be able to. Kaczynski had luck because he was twin. So you had two of them. Uh, that is going to happen very rarely, that you have another twin 
stepping in your shoes because it was the other two who was president, right, Joanna? So I think it was, uh, 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 was uh, uh, he stepped into shoes too, but he was the more strategic of the two. Correct me, Joanna. He was the thinker of the two, of the two, of the couple. So yes, there are weird ways of continuing. Uh, I guess Kuczynski is the weirdest. Uh, in Orban's case, it's not gonna be his wife. Nice lady probably, but doesn't seem to me that she's being groomed for this job. And that leads to a succession struggle. Lots of these cases, you have succession struggles. Uh, again, back to Russia, right? The most dramatic and amazing one is the one in the Bolshevik party. Because they did have a charismatic leader, second leader. So often it was said, Lenin and Trotsky. I remember even my first mentor, George Lukat, a very early text referred to Lenin and Trotsky as the leaders. He became a communist or was a communist, but eventually he didn't talk that way. But there was another charismatic leader there who was immediately accused of Bonapartism. By the way, in the Marxist tradition, that becomes a charge. If you want to rely on charisma and in his case, military success, because he was the organizer of victory of the Red Army. And he was immediately accused. And he's so under the shadow of Marxist facts or perhaps personal psychology that he does not use his charisma. It's so famous. Isaac Deutsche, the biography of Isaac Deutsche. I didn't want to tell my undergraduates because giving them more reading is a losing proposition. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Isaac Deutsche would be the three volumes. You can really read this drama of how a charismatic individual who could replace the other charismatic one, Lenin surely is charismatic. I mean, you don't show up in April 1917 and tell these people that everything they're doing is wrong and you should do something really different. Uh, mainly, mainly pretty close to what Trotsky would have said to them also who was also not there because he was in the United States, you can't do that without real authority. So he surely has authority. And Akansha, it was not, not authoritarian because in April, 1917, he could not have kicked them out of the party. He could not have punished them in any particular way. So for a moment, it was pure uh, uh, charismatic authority, but also knowledge that this person really knew how to organize and how to deal with revolutionary situations. But Trotsky was very good at that too. So everything Lenin had in April, Trotsky also had three, four years from then. Charisma, organizing ability, theoretical gifts. He missed one thing, which perhaps Gandhi and Lenin shared, namely the ability to make other people feel ill at ease. I mean, uh, feel comfortable. In other words, people could talk to Vladimir Ilyich or the Mahatma and feel good, not put down. He would listen, he was a good, they were good listeners. They still decided lots of things, but, and Trotsky was very bad at that. He was like me in this sense, uh, 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 you know, uh, my troubles at the new school, not to, uh, this is uh, like a farcical, uh, uh, revisiting of Trotsky's problems in 1923, which are much more serious. And I don't believe that an assassin is at the end of the road for me here at the new school. Uh, still, uh, uh, it's a common problem that you just, as the English expression says, you, have a, you really have trouble with fools. You can't suffer fools. That's, it's not a good characteristic. And Trotsky really could not. I mean, you could see in his, all his writings how polemical he is against people who are actually pretty close to him. So that's, that's something, I don't know, Gandhi's biography, a, a friend of mine who uh, uh, teaches now in Canada, uh, but originally of Indian background, uh, wrote a biography and I just have it, I should read it, but there are much, much of many biographies I am sure he could listen to people and, and, and deal with them and, and not make them feel that they were stupid. Uh, I, I, Lenin, 
is not quite Gandhian. I mean, if you read his writings, lots of people he made them feel stupid. But I think in terms of interaction, he was better. And that's one thing Trotsky obviously missed. These are the things you got to have when you're a leader. Orban was a very charming guy when I met him. To jump around from geography, very charming, and very very smart and very able to talk. And so, in his own leadership group, which he had to cement, which was originally four, five, six people, but also older advisors, uh, he really had to uh, behave in a uh, in a uh, friendly and uh, not authoritarian way. Does he behave that way now? That I don't know. Because now the temptation to uh, to talk down to people and to treat them in an authoritarian way must be very great. But it's this still matters. Then, uh, my course is not a course in social psychology, and I'm very bad at social psychology generally, but you can see that this matters. Adam, you have your hand up. Um, towards the end of your lecture, you said that we could think about taking authoritarian forms of populism as the secret of all populisms. And I was unsure about what you meant by secret. Is that something that refers to the like true essence of populism? Is it something that will eventually come about, you know, et cetera? No, Similarly, that, let's do that one and do the other question second, uh, because this is easy. I, you know, there are lots of people who think of it as, as strategic. Okay. So, Kurt Weiland, uh, Robert Barr, Say that yeah, these discursive definitions don't tell us what this thing really is. It really is a very effective strategy for gaining power. Uh, now, part of the strategy got to be discursive. So, the distinction between discursive and strategic can be made too sharp because part of the strategy is, is how you talk, how you talk to people, and in a way, bringing together different kinds of demands on a single heading is an intellectual task. And that you have to do pretty well. You have to see kind of uh, that uh, ecologists and women and uh, 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 some ethnic minorities and racial minorities uh, under Trump uh, have very different complaints, but somehow these complaints can be brought together in a single conception. By the way, this is not necessarily populism. That could be a democratic counter strategy. Uh, but populists do do that because the people are heterogeneous, so they must be good at, at, at unifying and bringing together demands. And they must be good at formulating uh, uh, slogans and strategies. And they must be good at, uh, uh, at linking those strategies with people to vote for. And these are strategic decisions. It's, I don't think it's the essence of populism uh, to anybody, these features, Although there is a tendency in this strategic school to treat it as such. That's what it's all about. It's not really about all the talk about direct democracy, about uh, expanding participation. It, it's about this, getting to power. And these tools are the tools. And so that's what I was talking about then. Okay, so your second question, Adam. Yeah, um, there, it was a similar confusion over a term. In your outline, under the other sources of ambivalence, uh, for point three, the third point under point three, you mentioned how uh, there's campaign struggles against the separation of powers. And then in brackets, you have the phrase deep state. Um, and I just didn't understand oh. why that term was there or what you meant by that. Oh, well, that's easy. Are you asking me good questions, but they're not hard. Akansha has me a really hard one. And I have to get into uh, the nuts and bolts of, uh, of, of Weberian theory because that's the only place you can find it not in Marx, but uh, these questions are really excellent, but not hard. Uh, so in, in that particular case, uh, what I mean uh, is, and it's, 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 it's again, similar question to your other one, ultimately. It's a distinction of the strategic aspect and the discursive aspect. Uh, the strategic aspect is that if I am, really thinking that I am the people or our group represents the people or is the voice of the people. Now, what the hell are courts? How were they appointed? Usually under, under a previous regime anyway. The second, in, rarely democratically. Are they lawyers? It's an elite. When you argue against elites, who are worse elites than the lawyers? Now, I don't think this way, but I study the lawyer and I'm interested in law, but you know, lots of people think lawyers. I mean, that's 
that's the kind of person I go to when I'm in big trouble because, because only they can help. But that's really somebody completely different. I'd never be friendly with them. Uh, lawyers are horrible. Now, you know, of course, Gandhi was a lawyer and Nehru was a lawyer. So this doesn't work great for India. Uh, I don't know if India, you have such a bad reputation for lawyers uh, as a result of that kind of, that kind of history. But, but you can see that that's, that's lawyers will, you know, they are not the people's will, they are instruments. They are people who know how to use certain tools and instruments. And so the courts, yes, they're not the people. And uh, even parliament, I mean, each deputy is elected by a very small portion of the people as Marx and Tokyo explain in 19th century writings. And of course, uh, uh, every single presidential candidate uh, implicitly knows that not only Napoleon III about whom they were writing. Uh, so who is the elect of the people as a whole? Me, I, Bonaparte, right? That's why the Marxists is called Bonapartism. All the others are elected by a part, small parts. I am, you know, so why should parliament tell me what I can and cannot do? So the separation of powers between Trump and federalism, similarly, they're only provinces, they're only parts of the state. I was elected by the whole. So that's the uh, that's what's going on. That's what's going on. And it has a discursive form too, but you know, it doesn't work well enough. I mean, I'm thinking of Turkey where the term deep state was invented. It doesn't work well enough because you know, even ordinary people sometimes have to go to the court to help them. And they voted for parliamentary deputies too, not just for the president. In fact, they didn't vote early on for Erdogan. Uh, now they can because he changed the system. So in that sense, uh, 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 there is a problem if you are gonna just attack parliament and the courts, which is what you're attacking and federalism in some settings. Uh, that's what's going on, uh, uh, but uh, there is also something else, which is both real and imaginary. The deep state. Erdogan invents it. I'm not sure if he did it or one of his publicists. Eventually gets around and even Bannon in the United States uses the term. Uh, you have elected us, and at one point this was right in the United States. Uh, the uh, uh, House of Representatives for two years was under Republican control. The Senate was, the president was, uh, and the court for historical reasons was five to four in the favor of Republican appointees, became six to three uh, during Trump's administration. Well, no, became five to four when he was able to pick Gorsuch. Was four to five, then Gorsuch was picked and then Kavanaugh. But in any case, the courts too were fairly close in composition to, to the president. And so in that sense, you needed some other antagonist. As somebody said, Carlos de la Torre, not only does populism re require enemies, it also uh, helps to create them, or, or could violent, actually make this point. It also creates enemies. Where there are none, you create them. Church was created in Hungary. I mean, at one point he was a Fidesz voter. He didn't, I don't know if he voted in Hungary, but he was a, 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 a Fidesz supporter. So how does he become public enemy number one? And it's not just because he's Jewish. Uh, you know, there are plenty of other Jews who could have been picked in the nationalist. And indeed they did not pick Netanyahu. That other bastard, right? They didn't pick Netanyahu uh, at all. In fact, there are friendly relations between Fidesz and, and we could. No, it's shorter. Well, because what? He's American. Uh, he is a, a multi-billionaire or billionaire, uh, which I guess everybody today, uh, any kind of money is a billionaire. Uh, the term didn't even exist when I was a child. Now, everybody uh, who's wealthy is a billionaire. Now, sure, so he is. And so it's a billionaire, and he's a civil society guy. Oh, he has been fostering civil institutions everywhere. He's behind all these civils. All these civils are always challenging authoritarianism here and there. That's the secret. He could not make me public enemy number one in Hungary because no one has ever heard of me. That doesn't work. 
you got to pick somebody who's already known. So Schroeder stands for me. I'm kidding. But I think I've done more for civil society. Well, no, that's not true. Schroeder has really, in actual fact, has really supported many, many civil society initiatives. And he rarely deprived them, including Fidesz itself, which was not, nothing but a youth organization to begin with. This is what Orban knew. So, so you, you got to uh, pick uh, an enemy. Now, in Hungary, I don't think they have said, they ever, ever said deep state. That's kind of interesting, though, why that uh, did not take, perhaps because no one thinks of the state administration uh, in the Fidesz leadership as a problem from any point of view at all. The ones who have problems were replaced. But in Turkey, because of a long tradition of Ottoman bureaucracy, and even the continuation of bureaucracy under the Republic, uh, the bureaucracy was seen as yet another obstacle. Because it is rule governed, Max Weber 101, back to him again, right? It's rule governed. And the populists do not like the rule of law or even the rule of rules. And so in that sense, the deep state was picked out even as they are fighting parliament, even as they are fighting the courts, uh, to pick an enemy who's really uh, formidable and you cannot get rid of. And plus, if elect, winning a single election is not enough. A single election could change parliament and the president. It could even lead to the appointment of new judges. But the civil service, and think about them, there's also, there is the civil service and then there's a military service. Big problem, general. I don't think in Hungary they represent a problem of any kind. Uh, uh, Barbara doesn't even know the name of a single general probably, right? Uh, uh, but still, uh, in Turkey, that was a really significant uh, threshold. Uh, and indeed, as a coup attempt, in 2016. So uh, taking over in the military, that's that's where the deep state, that's where the deep state comes in. So once you're in power, you got to fight not just the separation of powers, but you fight, have to fight for these bureaucratic organizations. They are bureaucratic organizations of one type or another. You even have to fight the media bureaucracy, who Trump never controlled. That was an amazing thing, you know. I guess in the U.S. you cannot do what Cesar said Fujimori did in Peru, namely buy them. Can't buy the New York Times. <laughs> you can buy single reporters, Adam is implying, so he's shaking his head, but you can't buy the whole organization, the Washington Post. Well, they bought, the, you know, when you enter into the world of the internet, there are indeed uh, the forms and structures that can be occupied and bought. But to buy their totality is different. Murdoch is what you're probably thinking of, is that Murdoch in some countries has managed to buy off uh, quite a lot. And he, uh, though he's not himself a political leader, has supported populist causes at different times. Certainly has supported Trump and has supported Brexit. So that's, yeah, that's perhaps that road is open. So you can surely buy generals, by the way. I think that uh, if you have trouble buying newspapers in some cases, uh, generals will not present, uh, not present such a problem. I mean, unless there's a war, what do they have to do except get rid? Uh, but in the United States, it is more complicated because of all the various structures that can interfere with even corruption. Cesar, you have your hand. Yes, uh, only uh, a, quest, a brief question related with the later issues that you were mentioning. Uh, what about uh, when the populist movements are in government, when they have to uh, coordinate with these civil servants' uh, body, so they create their own technocracies? So, as you said, that uh, there are some cases in which uh, they work in this way that they also create those uh, technocrat, uh, technocratic bodies. Uh, well, in Latin America, I bring the example of Fujimori because Fujimori uh, 
conflict uh, with the neoliberal technocrats. So he deal with this issue of the foreign debt with the World Bank. So and then he create like an enemy, which is the all the left uh, wing uh, parties or even the, all the oppository movements. Uh, they, they identify them as uh, terrorists, Bolshevik terrorists or Sendero Luminoso terrorists. So uh, what about the other cases in this way? Well, this last point, I mean, you see, for example, the, the Republican use of the Antifa. Uh, you can invent this in lots of places, in lots of settings. So that uh, that is uh, uh, a technique. Uh, and people who are more like the Bolsheviks than anybody else uh, invent Bolshevism uh, because otherwise you don't have any kind of enemy who is distinguished enough. Now, the other problem you talked about is different uh, because it has to do with both political parties and then bureaucracy. Level of political parties, there could be collaboration with other parties, but in fact, the other parties are structurally enemies of the, of the populist one. But uh, the difficulty, of course, is that uh, other parties could represent technocratic or technical expertise. That's where the techni technical expertise are. And when you attack other parties, in effect, you are also challenging many, many technical experts who vote for them, right? So you have a contentious situation which goes beyond just beating a party in an election because you have to deal with their technocrats who voted for them, who were appointed by them, who have family relations to them, and who by their very skills have affinity for them. And you got them in place. So the language of the deep state addresses that. But it can be dealt with only if you give them time. Fujimori had nine years, right, in actual power. And obviously the first phase of it doesn't work well enough because he has to carry out a self-coup. So he could not overcome the, I guess it was parliament, uh, the legislature, the National Assembly, that was the greatest difficulty. Maybe the courts too, you have to tell me. But he doesn't overcome all these oppositions and the self-coup attempts to do that. And under the self-coup, he has maybe another six years, right? Yeah, no, he has like the 10 years. I mean, the first three years were by election and seven years more seven, after the self-coup. So seven years now. So yes, and, and, and he later has a, uh, two other elections, but they was under the same regime. So it is hard to be able to be reelected and then his scandals and corruption and trips and all the rest interfere. But he has seven years. So it's an empirical question. Was seven years enough to replace all these other people? That's the question. For Erdogan, surely it was not enough. He came to power in 2002. Uh, first, and uh, uh, through various elections and various processes, uh, well, he remains in power 19 years later. That's uh, a significant part of time. Do they still speak about the, the deep state in Turkey after 19 years of having been in power? They did in, in 2010. So the first seven, eight years were not enough because the judges continued to interfere. So they linkage is a kind of populist linkage or or the construction of a strange uh, system of equivalences between courts bureaucrats parties people abroad you know Laclau uh, says the populist has a big problem in constructing a chain of equivalence among a variety of demands they have an even greater problem in constructing a chain of equivalence between the, among the enemies there should be one enemy. It's no good if it's too many of them. I mean, too many enemies fight each other. They're not formidable enough. So you really have to have, uh, you know, Juncker and, and Soros and the American Democratic Party and, uh, you know, uh, uh, some judges in Turkey still and bureaucrats and the press. And Islam is still because they go after Father Gulen. So they construct this very strange mix of heterogeneous entities. Uh, Gulen was his ally to begin with. Uh, so uh, this is what then is done. But that's the intellectual job of creating 
uh, a structure of of antagonisms, a two sided uh, two sided structure of antagonism. That's an intellectual creation. It doesn't exist, right? Uh, as indeed uh, the Marxist-Leninist antagonism between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie is unreal. In 1917, intellectuals, peasants, uh, uh, experts of various kinds, ethnic groups. Lenin has to confront all that. But the idea that there's only two struggling for uh, for supremacy is wrong. Then and the fascist idea of a world Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy and fascism <laughs> was imaginary. The fascists themselves had trouble being united, given the fact that German capital, uh, uh, German aspect of German labor, uh, a party, uh, the peasantry had to be united. So it's tough to fuse that. Uh, create that equivalent, but the enemy is an even greater problem. But aside from that intellectual task, there's also the political task, uh, which means change the judges, uh, elect a new uh, Congress under different electoral rules, and purge the bureaucracy. And that's what I asked you, was seven years enough for Fujimori to replace the official uh, uh, that, he con that he considered enemy? I'm sure he replaced a lot, but was that poo -poo? certainly Trump? Is it was a child, a, ch a child's effort compared to either Fujimori's or Erdogan's? You know, uh, yes, uh, the Supreme Court, which is the most visible thing, has become six to three. Bad enough for President Biden that he's going to have to face that. That's going to be a real problem down the road. The FDR had to face it in 1932 and did not solve it until 1937 or so. It took five years. And that's just a people, that's just a group of nine people. But what if you have to face uh, you know, tens of thousands of official officers, generals, uh, uh, people you can bribe some of them, uh, promote, to do things for them? It's easier to bribe a general. Or a lieutenant because you promote them, but but, but yeah, you uh, newspapers by the way are not suppressed. Uh, the Gulenite press was suppressed, so in that sense uh, you got to use different instruments for different dimensions. But the civil service is a specific problem, and it involves a lot of people. It involves uh, all the rules. Uh, it involves the potentiality of sabotage on their part of lots of things. Uh, and Trump, I'm sure, faced that, uh, as all these people face it, because your orders or your decrees or your rules are only as good as their execution. So, yes, the Supreme Court can visibly make something unconstitutional, but the low level men and women in the bureaucracy can make mincemeat out of your presidential order and decree. And they do all the time. Of course, they do it for, uh, for the good side as well as the bad side. But, but a populist government wants to unify things and wants to have its hierarchical control system effective on all levels. 